I'm Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen, and I'm about to offer you a unique opportunity, a glamorous guided studio tour of the history, culture and alchemy of A-list aesthetics. And the good news is we have a special audience with the father, the daughter and the Holy Ghost of Hollywood Regency star. Do me a favour, cast your eye around where you're sitting now. Are there, perchance, any pineapple-shaped accessories? Flamingos, palm trees, or perhaps a banana leaf? I am willing to wager a shiny silver shilling that, as a person of taste and distinction, your home is currently hosting at least an element or two from this list of decorating exotica, which means, my friend, that you have succumbed to the current contagion for Hollywood Regency. It is a style that has dominated the luxier corners of La La Land since La La Land was naught but a twinkle in the eye of the original Hollywood moguls, who first set up their tinsel tasmic dream factories in the Californian desert just before the First World War. And it is a style that, despite aggressive onslaughts from brutalism, modernism, postmodernism, minimalism, and zen simply won't go away. It is as tenacious, as eternal, as glamour. And now, in 2020, it is draping its lovely, voluptuous, plumptuous self over more glossy magazine spreads than ever before. And it is looking lovely and lush, thanks to designers like Kelly Wurstler, David Collins, Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen, Nikki Haslam, and with clients like Madonna, Jennifer Lopez, and of course, you. I'd like us to explore this extravaganza of eleganza via the work of its, in my view, three key aesthetic elders. That's William Billy Haynes, Dorothy Think Pink Draper, and Tony More is More Duquette. It's big, it's bold, it's dense, it's colourful, it's theatrical, it's dramatic, it's jazz hands, it's vampy, it's campy, and it hits you between the eyes with a giant ta-da! To all of which I say, a lusty huzza! From the start, Hollywood Regency always was anti-good taste. Leave understatement to the Hamptons, Cape Cod and the Upper East Side. Fabrics faded by decades of wasp sunshine in a subdued palette of old money pastels. Really? No thank you. Hollywood Regency is a celebration of lovely, shiny, new money. Why have rickety old antiques from the oldie worldy old world when you can have a Shazam of all the best bits from history that have a vaguely Georgian flavour to them? There's something childlike about Hollywood Regency. It's how kindergarten kids draw palaces, black and white marble floors, huge extravagantly draped curtainage, and chandeliers the size of a B-52 nose cone. And it grows directly out of the faltering first steps of the movie industry. This is where it gets its immediacy, its impact, and its sheer siziness. Until the 1920s, Hollywood was a quaint, quiet, bucolic vista of ramshackle vineyards. Overnight, it had to transform itself into, well, Babylon one week or... Alexandria the next, the Kremlin Palace, or Windsor Castle. So it used ornate door cases, fret cut from plywood, monumental drapes of common or garden burlap that had been dipped in plaster and painted, or an acreage of black lino floor brought to an obsidian shine when flooded with yacht varnish. Period detail and historical accuracy well, they weren't welcome at this feast where spectacle, scale, and above all, glamour were the guests of honour. 
And as the studios churned out historical blockbusters, so the property developers churned out block after block of budget-busting suburban villas for the good, the bad, and the just plain ornery of Hollywood's fledgling film industry. Breathing the same aesthetic oxygen as the nearby studios, houses were built in, a, in an array of fantastical fantasy styles. Tudobethan, Spanish colonial, Louis Quelque shows, Roman imperial, Venetian palazzo, but, but the one style that didn't sell in fantasy land was modern. That is the background of the Hollywood Regency style. So let us now start on the story of one of its earliest proponents, William Haynes. Eventually, William Haynes Incorporated would top-to-toe refurbish the White House for Ronnie and Nancy Reagan. But in the early 1930s, Haynes was staring disaster in the face. Rather surprisingly for the time, Haynes was uncompromisingly out and proud. He had been regarded as one of the brightest stars of the MGM matinee idol firmament until an unfortunate and actually unproven moment on a Santa Monica beach with a neighbour's youngish son and a dashant. To avoid public scandal, the studio wanted to broker a lavender marriage, but our Billy refused, and in a brave and rather beautiful gesture, sashayed away into the arms of his long-term partner, Jimmy Shields. They, in fact, remained together until Haynes' death in 1973. Joan Crawford called theirs the strongest marriage in Hollywood. Actually, Haynes had been career moonlighting for years. His acting had always been a tad erratic, and to fill the time between roles, he'd been running a very successful antiques business mongering mouldy old European tat to fellow starlets. There was an insatiable appetite to see the Hollywood glitterati in their natural habitat, and Haynes had built a below-the-counter business helping his fellow actors by sprucing up their duplexes, creating perfect, glossy, domestic backdrops for the schmancy at-home features the press devoured. Using his own furniture and all the experience of set dressing that can only come from being, well, part of that set dressing, William Haynes became stratospherically successful. So Yabu sucks to you, MGM. Here's Joan Crawford, a lifelong friend, in an early Haynes interior. Like La Crawford, it's all bone structure, architectural elements in shades of Georgiana, providing a climbing frame for some really rather dramatic Regency draping. But the sucker punch is that giant maggot of upholstery in front of the mantelpiece. Hollywood Regency loved scale and also rather enjoyed strange collisions. So amongst all that ersatz historicism, why not throw in a huge modern caterpillar for your cocktail party guests to perch and twitter on? In fact, big seating was a Haynes trademark. Look at how he's taken a, a perfectly unsuspecting early Georgian camelback sofa and bent it into a massive chintzy croissant. I particularly like what he did for studio chief Jack Warner here at Warner Castle. Schmick. Having been fired by Warner's bitter business rival Louis B. Mayer at MGM, Haynes is obviously making sure he's making a design point. And as revenge design goes, this is magnificent. Now, I think that Haynes was of our Hollywood Regency design trinity, definitely the most sophisticated and certainly the most aesthetically literate. His style actually evolved, unlike the other two. And as he matured, he started to create much more architectural schemes uh, that came to kind of define the luxurious but much more modern design language that the Palm Springs set, like Sinatra and Monroe and the young Elizabeth Taylor all adored. There was plenty of antiques, for sure. There were artefacts and huge ornamental lamp bases, but fewer and fewer historicised references. There was lots of plutonically expensive finishes, but simple architectonic planes and almost sculptural forms. And, of course, as many places as possible to perch 
with a whiskey sour and a finger sandwich. Our next luminary is Dorothy Draper. And in many ways, the Dorothy Draper look is the icon Hollywood Regency look that the world will turn to. It is Hollywood Regency, my dear, pink in tooth and claw. Poor Dorothy never could keep the lipstick off her teeth. Bumptious, overbearing and very, very full of itself, a Dorothy Draper room is the very doppelganger of its authoress. It's also where we'll find the Regency in Hollywood Regency. Now, don't go confusing the historical Regency style with good taste. It was a hot mess of fabulous. Hooked on immediate impact, shiny gold, black and white floors and overscaled overdrape curtains, textbook Regency style spans the late 1790s until the 1830s. It was named after the Prince Regent George, who would eventually become George IV. And George would have loved Hollywood. In fact, he was pure Hollywood. Just look at this monument to kitsch that is his Brighton Pavilion. Now, I filmed there so often and I'm still amazed by how wobbly everything is, fabulously over embellished, but as rickety as a Hispanic daytime soap set. Anyway, Dorothy Draper greedily gobbled up the shapes and the silhouettes and the outlines of classic Regency decorating and then she inflated them to five times their natural size with a stirrup pump. She was born into a gilded, gated world of upper-middle-class prosperity. Dot very much fitted the identikit cliché of pioneering early 20th century interior decorator. Hugely well-connected and bossier than a toddler, she'd rather bowl clients over with her tsunami slipstream as she hurtled from one job to another. Her authority was impregnable, her opinions immutable, but her smile was, as all agreed, radiant, which is just as well, really. I get the feeling that nobody was ever brave enough to question her. Anyway, classic Draper needs a, a huge nurse of scale, so all too often the best is to be found in those sprawling resort hotels that sprang up through the 30s and 40s, or in the monumentally marble department stores. The plain Janes from the plains and girls next door from, well, next door, absolutely loved Draper's swooshing staircases, trademark ornately decorated door cases. It gave their entrances into the hotel lobby or the department store hat boutique a faint reflection of Hollywood glory. Mirror and lacquer made Draper schemes dazzle and she'd used the broadest of broad brushstrokes to evoke upper crust social spaces that, well, that the suburban market to whom she was speaking wouldn't normally be given access to. Her colour schemes were bold to the point of simplistic and her steamrollering love of black and white and a tough love chamomile lotion pink made her look immediately recognisable and therefore in brand terms hugely successful. It's a hearty, slightly jolly hockey sticks do-over of classic Hollywood set dressing and it made the ant small hotel residents or the tiny shoppers that scuttled in and out of a titanic plaster scroll will feel as if they were actually in the movies themselves. And the joy of the Draper Empire was that those little ordinary drone ants could actually take Dorothy home with them. Because Draper's no-nonsense, brook-no-descent opinions on taste, style and frilly pelmets could be bought by the yard at the magazine stand or the bookstore. And her, frankly, carnivorous-looking fabric designs also came by the yard from the hardware store. It is her High Street Hollywood Regency that we today still see cluttering up our charity shops with white-painted wrought-iron telephone tables and gilt pineapple ice buckets. Our last musketeer of the Hollywood Regency, the final person I'd love you to meet, the Holy Ghost, is our most thoughtful, soulful, and craftily arty exponent yet. Tony Duquette started in advertising. He specialised in shop windows and display. He freelanced for Billy Haynes, and then he went on to become right-hand handbag carrier and aesthetic factotum for the great Elsie de Wolf. She was credited with being the 20th century's first proper interior designer, thereby making her the first 
ever interior designer. Transatlantic Elsie slithered from Belgravia to Fifth Avenue on a snail trail of ghastly good taste. And hands on Tony delighted her with the pseudo-baroque sconces and rococo trinket boxes that he made from shells, beer bottle tops, semi-precious stones, plaster, alabaster and sticking plaster, probably. With the famed De Wolf wind in his sails, Tony was quickly pounced on by Hollywood. It was his whimsical romanticism and his fiddly, twiddly, fairyland confections because they were the perfect dressing for those vast dreamscape dance numbers that were beginning to pepper the musicals of the 40s and 50s. He brought a new palette of inspirations to Hollywood Regency style that drew on much more sophisticated European precedents. From classic Regency and the Brighton Pavilion, Tony lifted a love of the exotic and he filled rooms with gilt bamboo screens and brightly coloured porcelain mandarins that nodded at you as you passed. He loved domed four-poster beds and incrustations of broken mirror, coral and glass beads. Like the original Regency designers, he, he used his love of richly coloured and patterned materials like malachite, lapis and mother of pearl. But he also introduced abalone shells from the Pacific, which he used as a, an iridescent mosaic across an entire wall. Duquette rooms always look very difficult to dust, and there's nothing more decadent than dust. Venice with its sequins, its carnival and its opera box architecture, was also an important element for Tony and his new wife Elizabeth, as was Paris, where they had lived for a few years. And then he took from the modern world surrealism, or more accurate, Daliism. Salvador Dali was a highly cultivated man, annoying beyond belief and a frightful show-off, but interwoven through his elephants on stilts art was a passion for the quirkier corners of 18th century design history, which was a peccadillo that was shared by and very much refined by Tony Duquette. By the time that Tony was designing for Vincenzo Minnelli and his daughter Liza and Wallace Simpson, Duchess of Windsor, or the more arty end of the Hollywood A-list, he was creating a style language that kind of floated through a constellation of eclectic star bright influences. And he was, in the old school tradition, a Renaissance man, and he made by hand much of the sprinkled chisel that defined his style. He was the one that made the gilded plaster monkeys that held the wire coat hangers bent to look like Venetian candelabra. He designed the gowns in which he wanted his glamorous clients to greet their guests and the jewellery in which they were to glitter. He decorated their parties, he arranged their flowers, he became empresario of their entertainments. He was the one that gave Hollywood Regency a boho hippie shot in the arm that lifted its stylistic fortunes after the, the heavy bourgeoisification at the hands of Dorothy Draper. He found room in this dressing up box style to shoehorn in the Oriental, the Rococo. And after he designed the smash hit Broadway production of Camelot, even delicate Sleeping Beauty medievalism. What is fascinating that although all three of our Regency rakes are dead, each still has a thriving company. An ink in their name. So, in the perfectly arranged Valhalla of American decorating, these three may be enthroned, coroneted and dogged in posthumous majesty, but back here on Earth, mortals may worship at their altar by offering burnt dollars as sacrifice to their brands. There we are, Hollywood Regency, and after all of that, I don't know about you, but I think I fancy a stiff one. <laughs>